this uh, 22nd was World Water Day, and uh, the theme was leaving no one behind. The imagination, of course, is India being surface water driven. The real issue, of course, again, is that India is a groundwater based civilization. It's groundwater that gives us all the water that we need, 65% of the water that we need, 90% of the water that we drink, it's not surface water. So that mind shift has been one difficult point for us not being able to understand and manage water and be in the crisis that we are with agriculture in our urban areas and generally with our habitations and with drought. One of the facts that we need to push is, of course, water literacy and within it, ecological literacy. And ecological literacy will begin by us understanding the true nature of the hydrologic cycle, the demands that we put on it, the sources of supply, and what the challenges are before us. So here's this famous photograph. Some of you may have had a chance to take a look at it. This photograph is from 71. The water is there, full, fabulous, step well. And this is how it is now. As part of the heritage conservation, we've been able to preserve the monument. The soul is gone. And we don't see that the water is missing. We think that it's a beautiful heritage. We go, it, go visit it and see it. But how will the water come back? That's the bigger challenge for us. And that, if we do not address that particular challenge of getting the water back in our wells and into our rivers, then we have a problem before us. We are not seeing this problem. A lot of the infrastructure projects that we do in our cities, including the master plan designs, do not include aquifers. In a city scarce for water, we design infrastructure to remove water. Take this beautiful step well and pond or Kalyani in Milkote, linked from the top of the hill to the tank through a catchment and through filters. Beautiful filters in the past, made of sand and charcoal where the water would pass through and then come in into the step well and fill it up. The first thing we did was build a road between the top temple and the pond and then put some culverts there and threw garbage in the culverts, disconnected the catchment from the pond. Now we fill it up with groundwater from bore wells. Yeah? So these sort of disconnects play themselves out pretty frequently with water. And the challenge before us as people who practice uh, architecture or planning or who, even citizens who are engaged with it is to understand the true nature of these connects. And here's the point, central point that I make is it's the invisibility of the resource that makes it difficult to handle. Aquifers and wells are hidden, they are not there. Though the well actually talks to us, we're able to see the water in the well and say that summer is coming, so the water levels are going down, we have to use less of water, right? Wells make groundwater visible. Wells talk to you, communicate to you. Wells are functional, they provide you water. Wells have given us the signs of dowsing, finding out where water is available, the signs of understanding a landscape and geology to figure out where you can dig for a well. Wells have given us technologies of lifting water. All these have come from wells, and this is a tradition which is 9,000 years old. The challenge before us is how do we include groundwater, which is the last in the column, as part of the design. You'd be surprised that the utility, which runs Bangalore's water supply, the Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Board, has not a single hydrogeologist. From an institutional and governance point of view, we have just this blind spot. We have no control on water, on groundwater, how much is being pumped out, how much has to be recharged. And therefore, there's no planning, there's no management, there's no understanding, and it's a free for all. And what then has been the consequence is that in the heart of the city, where we are now, groundwater tables are actually rising. But in the periphery of the city, it's collapsing. And we're not able to make sure that this rising groundwater table is put in into the network to substitute for the water which is collapsing in the periphery. That connect is not made because institutionally we are blind. So these uh, institutional and governance challenges, the invisibility of the resources, are some of the modern challenges that we need to address. And so how do we do that is to look at who addresses this problem and see whether the institution itself can be built up with human resources, with financial resources, to be able to, under, to tackle it and en engage in a conversation with it. So the solution for groundwater management is not really groundwater recharge as much as building the capabilities of the BWSSB to be able to understand and manage it. Th those are the sort of subtle differences that we need to tackle around. This city also has been the city of well diggers. There's a particular community called the Manuwadders who've been digging wells for a thousand years. And their cousin community, the Kalwadders, would cut the stones which would be used to line these old wells as they came along. And these livelihoods, the people who understood water and did the digging and the work, have now been forgotten in the modern paradigm of management. Here's the important thing to understand for people. 
if 100 liters of water falls on an empty site, an empty plot of land, 15 liters would run off and reach the drain, 10 liters would recharge into the ground, 75 liters would stay in the top one meter of the soil and evaporate or evapotranspire. The moment the site is built upon, that 15 becomes actually 100. The recharge virtually becomes zero. I've shown it as five, and the evapotranspiration is five because that's mostly evaporation. But this factor six or seven that we put on the system of surface drainage is the real cause for our urban flooding, is the real cause for lack of recharge into our groundwater aquifers. And so therefore, when we worked on the policy and the law, we made sure that we would do biomimicry and go back to an empty site situation and push households to harvest the rain which they would otherwise have sent into the storm drain. It was not to supplement water as much as to mimic the hydrological cycle. And so we got one of the easiest bylaws around in India, which says that for every square meter of roof area, you create 20 liters of storage or recharge. And for every square meter of paved area like this, you create 10 liters of storage or recharge. And when you make the recharge well, you make it a minimum of three meters deep so that you're able to send it away from the evapotranspiration zone of the roots of trees and bushes. That, that's the way it goes. So therefore, we need to work on the density question for cities as we work on water. One of the challenges has been cities have been designed for transportation. We want to make the workplace to residents distance minimum. We want to ship people in public transport as far as possible, as quickly as possible. But if a city has water as a naturally scarce resource, should it only be planned on the transportation model? Should it only be densifying itself and going vertical? Or should it look at water as a local resource and to manage it that way? So if you get cities like this with roofscapes, it's possible that we design roofs, which are otherwise heat sinks, to become places of production, like rice or minutes or vegetables or food crops that need to be grown there. As you can see, and this is quite a movement now picking up in Bangalore. Why do you do that? Because cities are also not designed for food production. The relationship of the city with water, the relationship of the city with food, and the relationship of the city with waste is not being clearly defined. So for me, the argument is that every citizen should have 40 square meter of land area, 40 square meter of land area, for her to be able to generate the water that she consumes, the energy that she consumes, the food that she consumes, but more importantly, the waste that is generated is also absorbed by the land. The rule is 40 square meter for Bangalore. How do we then imagine our cities to be designed around this 40 square meter is our challenge. And so therefore with 40 square meter, you can harvest the rainwater, use it for drinking and cooking. You can reuse gray water for the food production on the top of the terrace. You don't need fresh water. You only use gray water, gray water coming from bathrooms and washing machines. You can use solar energy for water heating, for lighting, for cooking from the 40 square meter. And if you are brave enough, you can use composting toilets to make sure that even human waste is not thrown out but reused as a fertilizer. And then you can be productive and actually be nutrition sufficient. So these are the new imaginations of communities and cities that we need to push if we want to make our urban areas sustainable. And you can get huge productivity from those small areas. This is one idea of the space that an average citizen in a city requires. The second idea that I'm pushing is the Manuwadar idea. People who are making a livelihood like Muniapa, digging wells. The advent of the bore wells means no more wells. But can we then bring them back to their original livelihood? And can that bring water resilience to the city? And we say a million wells for Bangalore. So if you make a million recharge wells for Bangalore, pick half the rain that falls on the rooftop into these wells, you will have an additional 1,500 million liters per day water in your aquifers. The bore wells that you have dug, 400,000, 500,000, will be full of water and you'll have the equivalent of a cavity below your feet. And all this will be achieved by the well diggers digging the wells, making a livelihood out of it, right? It's not large infrastructure that's going to solve the problem. It's actually small infrastructure and livelihoods which can address the problem. So the memory of the well has to be brought back. The livelihood around the well has to be brought back, but it has to be tied to rainwater harvesting and recharge. That's how you get. And that's water at 10 feet or 15 feet, even now in summer in Cabin Park. It has to happen in layouts, gated communities, that you push people to not drink individual bore wells, but to have community bore wells, but then every individual to make recharge and put, make sure that all water goes in into the aquifer. 
And then, of course, you have to work on the tariff metering. So it's not enough that you just push water in, you have to manage demand. And demand management can only come, not through education, but through pricing. Pricing is the only signal which reduces demand. Awareness does not. This one from Classic Orchards on Banergata Road, where they picked up about 120 truckloads of silt, and the well is full. And this well can give six to eight months of water for the entire community. But the BWSSB sends subsidized water. Therefore, citizens do not have an incentive to use local water. How do we push the subsidy regime of the city to talk to local resources, to make sure that local resources are used once they are protected and preserved? How do we integrate wastewater with lakes? So there's a 10 million liter per day wastewater treatment plant upstream of the lake, then a wetland, a constructed wetland. This constructed wetland is about seven acres, is able to remediate 10 million liters, has a retention time of three days. So the water that comes in from the sewage treatment plant and untreated sewage stays there for three days in this wetland and then comes out crystal clear. Fosters livelihoods in the lake, fishes, yes, 250 kgs of fish a day if possible. The fish can actually pay for the running of the sewage treatment plant. That's the way you can construct it if you have an ecosystem design. And recharges wells surrounding. We guess that about seven to seven and a half million liters per day is recharged by this lake. This well can provide drinking water at 75 paisa for 1,000 liters. It has transformed wastewater to drinking water using ecological services, enhancing biodiversity, providing for livelihoods, and removing the yuck factor. So can we imagine 200 lakes of Bangalore to be around this model? That's the challenge before us. And finally, what happens to all the sewage and the muck that goes out from our cities? This is uh, the froth and froam, famous Belandur, Vartur. So it goes, the suds, the detergents, three kilometers downstream. The river has no froth or foam. They have wells nearby. Farmers dig wells, push the water, and pump it seven kilometers. Untreated wastewater from the wells, pump sets all along, and then they push it into farm ponds, like I said, six, seven kilometers away. Diluted with borewell water, you grow vegetables and crops. Key question is, can we push these people to grow non-edible crops? And in this town in Vijaypura, this farmer picks up untreated wastewater, untreated wastewater, raw sewage. The family starts to work there and starts to irrigate and grow mulberry leaves, mulberry leaves, which is non-edible. And it's from shit to silk. It's actually untreated wastewater to silk saris. This is the kind of imaginations of transformation where the farmer's field is seen as a sewage treatment plant where you actually the town does not require a sewage treatment plant. And all that the farmer does is grow non-edible crops and makes a livelihood and earns a living. Can we bring these imaginations into our towns and peripheries is the question before us because the fruits are then gloriously delicious. Honeysuckers, which empty pit toilets and septic tanks, again, using fields as places of treatment, composting the waste on the field and growing grapes. So this is shit to wine. So shit to silk, shit to wine, using land, using farmers, using well diggers. These are the new narratives that we need to put in play in our cities and really see waste as something of a resource which needs to be carefully fine-tuned. Do we have the institutions? Do we have the legal framework? Do we have the standards for this? The answer is no. For now, all these are illegal practices. How do we make them legal? That's the big question before us. Thanks for listening in on a Sunday breakfast time. That's it. I'm happy to have conversations and questions. It's possible for it to affect it in a bad way. Uh, if you have heavy metals in it, if you have too much of sulfates in it, it, it can harm it. If there are industrial effluents in the sewage, it will harm the crops. In a good way, domestic sewage applied on land means the farmer needs 80%, 90% less fertilizers. Here's the thing, phosphates in water causes eutrophication, frothing, and foaming. Phosphates on land is a fertilizer. Crops need that phosphate. It's a good fertilizer. Should we grow root crops? No, we should not grow root, root crops with domestic sewage. We should not. If we do, then we should peel it, wash it with potassium permanganate, and reduce essentially bacteria on top of the root crops. We should not grow it as far as possible. But even if we grow it, we can take care of it. We import all the phosphates that we need, but we push it into our detergents. We don't push it into our fertilizers. The same phosphate in land is a fertilizer. The same phosphate in water is a nuisance. It goes in into vegetables. It's good to go into vegetables. You should not get heavy metals into vegetables. 
or you should not get nickel cadmium lead into heavy metals. So that's, that's the only danger that we have. You see, the point is that in India, can we have the luxury of the highest standards or do we take a risk mitigation approach in which we one step at a time address the problems and go towards a particular goal? It's incredible that groundwater is at 20 feet, even now in summer, and it's crystal clear groundwater. If we make sure that we do rainwater harvesting and recharging, then that water is available to us for eight months, 10 months in a year at 20 feet in almost all the old pockets of old Bangalore, right? Our guess with the well diggers is that there are 10,000 open wells in Bangalore which have water which are being used, and that easily it can go up to 100,000 which can be used. The shallow aquifer is lying completely unused. Now, if my neighbor has a well, there's no reason why I should not be getting water in my well, right? But I don't know that he has a well or she's using it. If I know, could I make a more rational decision? Could I then recharge? And could therefore the well digger become the ambassador to market the well and get a livelihood in the opportunity? That's the idea. Just do an inventory of the local uh, wells, uh, aquifers, and do a, uh, take a look at the nearest lake and see whether the community can work on those wells and the lake simultaneously. Wherever lakes have been revived in Bangalore, and citizens group have done a fabulous job in many places, right? Immediately the shallow aquifer has revived. So it's now, therefore, the next move is to tap into that shallow aquifer and get those wells going, right? So we need these discussions around water. The lifestyle argument comes from people who attend creative mornings in early, um, it, 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 it uh, touches two to five percent of the overall population. This would be the nutcase environmentalist like you and me, long hair and running about uh, eating food. You do it because you feel good. Does it make a difference in the overall narrative? Sadly, it doesn't. But if you want to feel good about it, pick up gray water, reuse it, put in place simple systems mm, for demand management and reduce the hell out of your consumption. Doesn't make a damn difference to the world. That doesn't mean go splurge on it, but I'm saying systemic fixing is the challenge. I'll make one another point. We can return back to nature, water, at the same quality and the same quantity at which we appropriated it. Let's say we took clean 100 liters of water from the Kaveri. We can give back to Kaveri at the same point, not 100 liters, let's say 80 liters of the same quality if we are ready to pay 110 rupees a kiloliter. 110 rupees for 1,000 liters, if we are ready to pay, we have the treatment capabilities for the sewage. We have the pumping and the gravity capabilities to do that. If we do that, there's no net loss to the system from an urban area. Would you want to change your lifestyle or would you want to get the BWSSP to do this? Would you want people to pay that 110 rupees or would, they, would you want them to build a 32,000 crore flyover? I mean, these choices are the ones that are there before us. Those are the bigger ones, the bigger numbers. So what you do there in this system is to separate urine and feces, right? So the urine can be diluted and applied as a fertilizer almost directly and immediately. The solids need to be covered with ash or soil or compost and allowed to desiccate for three to six months. And that it becomes excellent compost and you can reuse that. So let no man put together what God has separated. No, that's the whole idea. Uh, it's been human beings who started to push this together, typically civil engineers, and then spent the hell out of technology trying to fix the problem. As a bodily function, it comes separate, but then man decides to push it in pipelines and then set up sewage treatment plants, push money, energy, bacteria to clean up the whole act, and we were discussing what the hell is happening there because antibiotics are landing up in the sewage treatment plants and bacteria are getting to be drug resistant, and we've got now a whole plethora of bacteria which no antibiotic can kill. And it all starts from the loop and our practices there. So that's how it is. 
So, uh, a couple of laws which exist need to be implemented. Those are the pollution laws. Our regulators, like the Pollution Control Board, has failed us abysmally in implementing those laws. Industrial effluents coming in into stormwater drains or lakes, that, that's a question of implementation. With new laws, we need new laws on groundwater management, which is practical and which pushes groundwater to be regulated a bit more than what it is right now. And perhaps we need more and better implementation of the rainwater harvesting laws, which are there in place, right? But ultimately, we also need the master plan and the infrastructure plans to start to talk to local resources of water more. We need that. So we need building bylaws, which will help us. We need master plan, land use plans, which will help, uh, which will help water if it's so significant. And in fact, the bylaws, for example, have pushed for parking. So you have double basement parking, triple basement parking. They destroy our aquifer, pump out shallow aquifer water and throw it out into the land. And the master plan has simply, in the name of the car, killed our uh, wells and shallow aquifers. So the car is not only deadly when it moves on the roads, but it's deadly when it's stupidly parked also, right? So that's one way the master plan and the building bylaws can talk to aquifers better. In areas of good aquifer water uh, carriage, we should push for basement parkings to be avoided and parkings to be given on top. So here's the difference. In many places, the shallow aquifer is disconnected from the deeper aquifer. Right? In some places, it's connected. So those places, when you dig a bore well, your open wells go dry, or the shallower bore wells go dry. In that place, there's a hydrogeological connectivity. In some places, you dig a bore well, but the open well continues to have water. There's no hydrogeological connectivity. Ultimately, all deep bore well recharge has to happen through the shallow aquifer, whether at that place or through a slightly farther place. Right. So we, when we begin to recharge, we'll first impact the shallow aquifer, but eventually we'll also impact the deeper aquifers. And somewhere, we'll have to move away from the deep aquifer and come back to the shallow aquifer, because the shallow aquifer is annually replenishable. Every year's rain replenishes that. The deep aquifers is usually fossil water. So it's taken a long time for it to accumulate. And we've used it up now. Now, therefore, we are struggling. So that transition has to happen. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, nothing. Thanks for coming and uh, hanging around. And hopefully, we'll have those conversations at Zen Rain Man, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Subscribe here. <laughs>